Okay, it says we're live. Hi everyone, this is Vicki from Profello. I'm just gonna do a little tech check just to make sure this is working properly. I see we're broadcasting, but I'd just like to take a moment to double check that this is streaming at the YouTube link, so please bear with me. All right. We are good to go. Okay, so let's get started. We have an hour um, to talk with a panel of extraordinary people who are. All right. Um, oops. We are good to go. Okay, so That's let's get started. That's me playing we have in an the hour. background. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Okay, so we've got our panel of experts here, and I'm really, really pleased to speak with all of you today. We're going to be getting into your personal strategies and secrets to winning fellowships, which all four of you are experts at doing from your background. So uh, I know a lot about your backgrounds, but I would love if each of you could kind of give me a quick um, intro about some of the awards that you've won, programs that you've done, and also uh, what you're doing now. And is it different than what you did you know, when you were winning your awards? Um, I'll start with you, Jack, if you can just give an introduction. Sure, sure. Um, Jack Bianco. I'm with the United States Small Business Administration out of Washington, D.C. Uh, that makes me a federal employee. I've uh, been aligned with public service for approximately 15 years now. Um, but previously, I've worked in uh, state government, which was obviously public service, but higher education and uh, the field of human services. Uh, I've been lucky enough to do uh, three significant fellowships during the course of my uh, career, including the Eisenhower Fellowship in 2016. Uh, what was formerly called the Annenberg Fellowship is currently called the Excellence in Government Fellowship uh, about seven years ago. And then early in my career, which is what brought me to Washington, D.C., was a Presidential Management Fellowship or PMF experience. Uh, happy to join you all today. Thank you so much, Jack. Okay, how about you next, Cordell? Hi, Cordell Carter. I'm currently director of the Socrates program for the Aspen Institute. I have won four competitive fellowships over the last 21 years. So I did start in college, just FYI. Um, first, it was a public policy international affairs fellow when I was a, a college junior. Uh, then it was the uh, Bosch Fellowship uh, in 2007, spent a year in Germany. Uh, then there was the Eli and Edith Broad Residency in Urban Education, um, two years in Seattle Public Schools as an attorney. And lastly, uh, most recently, an Eisenhower Fellowship to China in 2016. Awesome. That's incredible. Okay, uh, next, Kara. Up, oh, you're muted. Let me unmute you. I think you have to do it, Kara. Oh, yes, Kara, please do. Unmute yourself. <laughs> Can't hear you. <laughs> Wait, as you're working on that, Ashley, why don't you go next? And Kara, we'll work on your issue. <laughs> so my name is Ashley Watson. Um, I work at Tennessee Tech University as the Assistant Director of Inter um, International Recruitment and Graduate Recruitment. I was a Gilman um, scholarship winner as well as a Fulbright English teaching assistantship and most recently a foreign language and area studies to study Swahili. Fantastic. And hey, hey Vicki, this is Jack. I know we're working out the, the chat feature. I think Kara <laughs> I did. I unmuted her. I, she, she's ready to go. I am unmuted. I am right. here now. It was telling me the host <laughs> muted me, but I don't, I don't actually did, so I don't know what happened. But here I am, um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this panel because for a long time, I just felt like there needed to be a strong network of folks who are really interested in the unique opportunities that fellowships provide, and they certainly were life-changing for me uh, personally. Um, in terms of fellowships, I've, I've had a number of competitive, both scholarships and fellowships, so I attended college on a venture scholarship, um, and then uh, was, had the wonderful opportunity to do a Watson Fellowship uh, for a year abroad. Um, I was a Coro Fellow, uh, for those of you familiar with that program. Um, I went on to uh, go to MIT for my MBA as a 4K Fellow, which promotes um, women leaders in business, and uh, won a Seeley Award while I was there um, for student contributions, um, and I was a Harris Fellow at the University of Chicago. Um, so that's kind of my fellowship, kind of scholarship history. 
Uh, I have always been a very mission-based person, a social impact uh, person uh, by nature. And so I have my own small company, Mission Spark, which works exclusively on strategy with nonprofits, government, and philanthropic foundations. And I'm the author of a book, Fail Better, Design Smart Mistakes and Succeed Sooner. So I'm thrilled to be here. So thanks. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, as you can see, we have a pretty extraordinary panel uh, representing a wide range of fellowships. So let's get right into the questions. Um, I spoke with each of you about you know, your top one or two tips that you would give people that are applying to competitive fellowships. And since you've done this multiple times, um, just tell me like the one or two things that really struck you as, as a good strategy when approaching the applications. Um, Cordell, why don't we start with you? Well, the first thing you wanna do is, is do your research. Um, in this digital age that we live in, anything you wanna find out is available. Um, you don't have to do a tremendous amount of work to find it. I, I found my first two, I should say my second and third fellowships online. I did a, 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 a Google search for, um, it, was, it was leadership, executive, entrepreneurship. And the first two results were Bosch and Broad. I applied wow. for both of them, one and both. So you got to do your research. Of course, you got to know your narrative and all that good stuff. But number one is know what you're applying for. Great. Um, Kara, how about you? Uh, I think for me, uh, having served on both a scholarship selection committee and or fellowship selection committee and been on the other side of that fellowship, I do think just kind of building on what Cordell is saying, it's really important to kind of know a little bit about yourself and that, that narrative and be able to kind of not just throw every fellowship or scholarship to the wind, but look a little bit for kind of what's the authentic angle that's that's right for you. I think there are multiple fellowships that might meet that need. So it's not to say that you shouldn't explore more broadly, but that you actually are kind of saying this fellowship would really add something. I'm really excited about this fellowship and the opportunity that provides it really fits with what I want for my life or what I might want to explore um, and not just make the decisions on, oh, this is this is prestigious or this is, you know, I should be doing this or those sorts of things. I think there's just so many unique opportunities that are life changing that it, the decisions shouldn't be made on that alone. Very, very good point. Um, Jack, what would you recommend? Um, so agree with uh, all the comments. I, I think um, uh, the, the, the age of the internet, the resources that we have available, including you know all the information that Vicki, you have on Profello, um, I would also just reinforce the offline opportunity to discover things. As I reflect back on many of my fellowship or leadership development opportunities, they were because of offline face-to-face -face discussions with mentors. Me mm -hmm. articulating that I needed something or I think I need something, but I'm not quite sure what it is to add to my tool bag in my career at the time. And um, many times it was, hey, have you checked this out? They had either had direct exposure, they were on a board of directors they had heard of. So yes, I, I probably could have found it through a Google or Bing search or even on Profello. But uh, offline, don't discredit that because uh, folks may uh, have their recommendation of what might be a good fit for you in your career. And it might carry a recommendation with, with that also. So you might luck into something if you have a, a network or the benefit of having mentors. Very, very good point. Um, and Ashley. Um, so one of the things that I, would suggest is uh, just making sure that um, you show a little bit of humility in your search. It's okay to say what you don't know or what um, what this opportunity will bring you. It shows that you're humble. It shows that you're willing to learn also. Great. Now, to cut, let's dive a little deeper on some of these things. Um, Cordell, you mentioned about, you know, doing your research and beyond just finding a fellowship, what other kind of research should people be doing? You know, when you got those two fellowships that you found in your Google search, I mean, what else did you do before you decided to apply? Was there anything else you looked into to see if, how did you know you were a good fit or that you'd be a good candidate? Yeah, I, um, I love reading leader biographies and, mm. uh, before the, uh, Dominance of the internet age, you actually have to read Who's Who. And yeah. encyclopedias, you remember this, Who's Who's American, leadership directories. And you would see all these affiliations. And I was starting to see a common path. I saw the Aspen Institute. I saw things like Rhodes, I, Marshall Scholars, all these things. And, and I began to do specific research on those things to see what, what matched my career path that these folks that I admire 
had. Um, and so um, I was looking for those career propelling events and, and things. And I thought fellowships would be the way to go uh, to get me where I want to go faster. And, uh, and so I, I was, I, I say do research, but it's like a bifurcated process. You want to look at the people you admire. What, what is their path? You see the glory, but you don't know the story. Figure out what their story is and mm-hmm. then try to figure out what you can emulate from their story and from their path um, to be in the same rooms that they have been. And so that really drove the research I did later, um, looking at these fellowships. Once a lot more information was available, I didn't have to go look at directories anymore. You just go on Google and find things. That's what I did. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember. I saw this in that person's path. I saw this in that person's path. And uh, it really helped me target opportunities that I, I wanted to go after. Well, it just sounds to me, just breaking that down, that you had a really clear idea then of, of the type of person or field or work that you wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And then you uh, basically worked backwards from that to figure yeah. out what do I need to do to get there? Exactly. I think that's really smart rather than just sort of, I don't know what I want to do. And <laughs> you yeah, go well, out, so you find those people. Approach. I was yes. trying to be more uh, precision with the, the sniper approach. The sniper approach, I love that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> um, Uh, Okay, Ashley, you know, you mentioned, you know, don't be afraid to say what you don't know. I mean, that's not something typically people want to do in an application. They feel compelled to say everything that they do know and how great they are. But what do you mean by that, by what you don't know? Um, A few things. As I mentioned, it does show humility in your application. It shows that you are teachable, that you're curious. Um, If you're already an expert, why would someone bring you to the table? There's nothing you can learn. Uh, if you say you know everything. Um, And a lot of these fellowships, there is some sort of community base. So they want you to learn not just through your experience, but with other people around you uh, and that experience. So I do think it's important to say, this is my purpose. My purpose isn't just so I have this great name on my resume, but so I'm learning something, I'm developing, and hopefully able to give back. That's great. I mean, I do um, see that in really strong applications, people having a specific idea of what they want to learn and what they'll gain from the fellowship and really emphasizing that in the application, which sounds like what you did in yours. So that's great. Um, Now, Jack, uh, you talked a lot about sort of uh, working with mentors and, um, you know, I think in this day and age of like the digital world, you know, we sort of feel like, yes, we can find all the information we need online. Um, What's, where's the value in sort of working with people in person these days um, from your perspective and the mentors, finding a mentor. Sure. Um, so I, I think uh, somehow I was lucky to s- discover, you know, the value of uh, advice early on. I think before the mentor momentum or wave sort of hit, uh, I think, you know, as Ashley mentioned, being humble, uh, active learner, recognizing that you don't know everything. You know, we all hit points in our career, whether it's academically, professionally, uh, in our civic or charitable lives where we we are valued, we are talented, but still we don't know everything. And uh, if we're either learning to contribute or to de- further develop ourselves, um, that, that we learn how to research things, how to seek advice. And um, I have the benefit also working in the world of entrepreneurship. <laughs> so any startup or uh, aspiring business founder or existing business owner, we advise them to seek mentorship too even if they're just purely looking for finance or market penetration or what have you. Um, the type of feedback, it's not something, you know, it takes up six hours of every eight to 10 hour day, but it's something that you periodically schedule in. Uh, in the business world, you, you might hear them referred to as a board of advisors. I think uh, as we talk about the brand you, the brand me, we're at, we are kind of products, uh, mm-hmm. even as leaders, um, have you considered having a personal board of directors or mentor network? to give you ongoing support, compensate for some weaknesses or opportunities for further growth because of their skill set. And then also um, the career perspective, right? If you're you're young and you need to grow your network, you're a little bit uh, older and mid-career, you need to develop some expertise you never got around to, or perhaps later in life if you want to shift industries, right? Those are all different types of mentorship. So I don't think it's just one uh, category of somebody who's older and wiser in your immediate chain of command. I think 
you know, being open to getting those type of feedback. And I've applied much of that to my fellowship experience once or twice, as I mentioned earlier, having a discussion with mentors of what do I need to get myself going, to seek additional leadership opportunities. And the feedback was, have you checked out this fellowship or leadership opportunity? Those are offline. But uh, in the digital world, it should be that much easier, but you need to make that personal connection, especially if somebody's going to give you their valued input or a recommendation. Okay, I love that the the personal board of directors, which doesn't isn't doesn't have to be as as formal as it sounds, but I love the idea of keeping in touch with, you know, you know, people from work, professors, just people that you admire that you've worked with, um, staying in touch with them, getting their feed, asking them for feedback. Sometimes we're afraid to ask for for feedback about you know, hey, where am I at this point? <laughs> How do I get the skill? What could I do? Thanks. That's a really really good uh good piece of advice. Uh, Kara, you talked about, um, you know, being your authentic self in an application, not applying for things just because they're prestigious or sound great. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in your take on this because you've not only won a couple fellowships, but you've also been on the other side uh, of the of the table watching all of these uh, Watson fellows come in through the selection process. So um, sometimes I think when we're doing these applications, we, we try to start saying things that we think the, the committee wants to hear because you know, you're just having this here high pressure situation, but how do you stay authentic? What tips would you give um, to, to not come off inauthentic, really, even maybe when you're not intending to? No, I appreciate that. And I'd, I mean, I'd love to build on what Jack was saying um, around um, uh, some recommendations that I think in some ways are antidotes for some of the things that I've seen in the fellowship selection process that kind of come up for candidates. And uh, one of those is knowing, knowing yourself. And I love the idea of getting feedback in advance and being open to that feedback around how others see you, how others experience you, both, you know, the strengths and unique qualities that you bring to the table, um, but also ways that you might be showing up that you're not really aware of, um, you know, how you speak up in class or, or how you're, um, in, uh, how a boss might be perceiving you, because I think that also shows up in how you interview for fellowships, um, if that makes sense. And the first example of, of some things that I see it that are about, you know, maybe authentic self play a role both in the application, so the written application process, and then also when you show up for an interview. And it's it's something that I'd probably refer to a little bit as bridging, you know, so we can't completely disregard what the fellowship's intent is and, and kind of what its purpose for existence is, but also in showing up as your authentic self around your passions and the unique things that you bring to the table. In some ways we have to be bridging those, you know, bridging that in a, in a successful way, kind of really making relevant through storytelling, through specific examples, through um, a little bit of your personality, I guess, coming through uh, to illustrate certain qualities or aspects of the fellowship that you really do feel um, are a good match. And I think that happens in the writing. Um, and those are the essays and things that really come alive, I think, for all the ones that I've read in the past. And then in the moment, you know, when you're interviewing, also being able to have a few anchor stories. So if you're somebody who gets very nervous when you come in <laughs> to interview for fellowships or, or just kind of been thinking in the moment is, is kind of hard, you might want to have a few anchor stories that you feel really comfortable and alive and passionate about telling that you feel can do that bridging uh, type of work. So that's one example I, I just quickly wanted to give. And then the other, I think, really um, connects to some of the earlier comments that were made about either underplaying or overplaying yourself, because both of those, especially overplaying, I think tends to to read as pretty, you know, inauthentic or telling people what they want to hear. Um, and the underplaying uh, that sometimes I see is when people struggle to take ownership of what the contributions that they've really had in something, um, which is sometimes a beautiful quality because you're being very collaborative in nature. So, you know, we built this, we did this. I, I would encourage that humbleness for sure to be coming through. And when you're not humble, it it hurts, um, you know, in these application processes, but finding ways to talk about that, where we talk about what we built together and being able to say things like, I was really privileged to play this role in moving this forward, being specific about the examples that you can give are really authentic, what is an authentic way to do that? Because you're not trying to overplay what your role is, but you're also not underplaying. You're still taking ownership and showing your unique contribution um, while still indicating. And the one quick example I'll give is actually not a conversation that was had, but it was actually a, um, an interview process. So for any of you who are interested in the Coral Fellowship, it's a very interesting interview process. And uh, part of what it does is, 
you actually get put into a room with a set of teammates and you have to engage in some activities together. And uh, one of the activities that um, the team that I was in had to engage in was people couldn't speak. They had to just work together in a group on a project or a task that was given to them. Um, what were people in the room watching for? They were actually watching for how well you collaborated, how well you were willing to give voice to others or share voice or share responsibilities, not just own. And I know multiple people in that in that particular exercise who were not selected because they were so busy trying to impress with how they were going to take charge and you know own the piece of it that that they kind of missed it <laughs> you know they kind of yeah. missed really just up in an authentic way so just a, a concrete example of how it plays out that is a actually a really good point uh, most of the fellow I, I think all of the fellowships that i applied for there was a group interview process that had um whether it was a group where i'm speaking in front of a panel but a few of them including the new york city urban fellows program had that similar situation where we had to work with the other candidates um and if you're not really knowledgeable about them the purpose of that activity you could easily like you said talk over other people or you're so concerned about, oh, I don't, I want to be heard in this, <laughs> that you miss the point of the activity, which is to see how well you're going to collaborate. And I'll tell you what, fellowship programs, the things they want most these days are collaborators, teamwork people, people that are going to show up well, represent the organization well, um, and be successful in the program. They're not looking for uh, people that are going to kind of bulldoze their way into a, a fellowship position. So that was, thank you for bringing up that really specific <laughs> example for that. I think some people just don't know what that means. Right, right, what, what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Now, um, well, let's talk a little bit more about interviews. So if you got through the application process, you get the interview. I wanna see what your tips are for preparing for the interviews. What did you do, um, if anything? Maybe you did nothing, but um, Ashley, uh, I'm going to unmute you. Why don't we start with you? Because I'd love to hear, you know, how you prepared. You you did a Fulbright, which is, um, I don't know if yours specifically had an interview process, but I know a lot of people will be getting ready for the Fulbright interviews soon. So I did have an interview uh, with a panel. Um, there were two parts to it. Um, I will be honest, my interview was not the greatest. And it wasn't, I felt like I was prepared. Um, but there was a panelist that their questions and the way they approached my essay really took me off guard. Um, but because I knew the reason why I applied, I didn't shake my confidence. And I think that stood out to the other panelist. Um, so for the Fulbright, I was uh, an undergrad when I applied. So um, I applied through my university. You could apply through your institution or you could apply at large. And applying through your uh, institution, you need someone from your institution to push your application forward. Um, so it was very important that I did impress my panel. But again, I think going into it, I had thought about why I was doing uh, the Fulbright, what I was hoping to get out of it, what I wanted to do when I left in terms of my project. Um, and having that anchored inside of me just made it so much easier to talk to the panel. That's that's great. I like that you were sort of prepared knowing. I mean, almost every fellowship asked those questions like, why are you doing this? What are you going to do? What are you going to do next? So you really should have like a really clear and specific response for that. Did any of you um, do a do a mock interview or, or try to practice with anyone ahead of time? Jack, you're shaking your head. Let's what did, what how did you do that? Yeah, um, well, let me answer that and then bundle. I, I love the uh, discussion already. Uh, it's, it sounds like we've got a lot of similar experiences, but different fellowships, different formats. It's definitely a learning uh, environment. So um, uh, there, there's an old there's an old joke. I'm dating myself, but it's uh, it's a question. You know, somebody asks, "How do you get to Carnegie Hall?" Uh, and, the, and the joke part of it, the answer is uh, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> Right, so uh, we talked. You asked about rehearsing for panels. Um, I think it ties in uh, exactly with the discussion to date. You've done your research, your due diligence. You talked to mentors. Uh, if you've really ramped up your game, if you haven't accessed an alumni or participant from the program previously, really, uh, I think I've been lucky, part effort and part luck, to access those folks. Uh, at the very minimum, having a chat. If not, having them sort of give me some feedback on what I imagine my responses would be um, to some of the uh, then anticipated questions 
Um, that's again, very much like the world of entrepreneurship and startups. If an entrepreneur seeks guidance for, from us on how they survive the uh, elevator pitch or shark tank mm -hmm. experience, right? And quite often a fellowship is like a shark tank experience. Um, we coach them to talk about the why before the what. So we find most folks, and if you watch Shark Tank or something, people are so eager to talk about the what, what they've done, where they are. And sometimes it's better to start about the why. Uh, folks have talked about their passion, their goal, their aspiration, which this is not an absolute comment, but I think uh, many times when I've been on a selection committee, we're seeking the why. We're trying to attain a, a return on investment by picking smart candidates that have a fit and play into the the goals of the host organization foundation or what have you so i would uh, reiterate again the uh, the why is very important yes you do have to talk about your certifications accomplishments and those things but come off as somebody who's very uh, interested and uh, i think that's also when you rehearse and practice your friend and especially if it's a friend they're going to give you a critical feedback of saying <laughs> are you telling that story properly are you putting me to sleep? Are you giving me the chronology of your career as opposed to what do you want here? Why are you applying for this one rather than that one? Yeah, get the get the friend who's blunt that will tell you, <laughs> not the friend that'll say everything you're saying is great, or your mom or somebody you'll say, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> you know, get the person who's blunt. It's funny that you mentioned that about um, entrepreneurs because I often uh, sort of say that fellowships are like. Um, you know, you're, you're pitching to a committee that's making an investment. So this isn't a prize for all the wonderful things you've already done, um, you know, end of, end of career prize. This is an investment for what you're going to do in the future. So it's your, what you've done already up till here is um, just a demonstration that you could be successful, but really it's about what's, what are you doing next? And sometimes people get so caught up talking about everything they've done that they forget to really hone that that story of what they plan to do next and what the fellowship's going to do to get them there. So thank you for bringing up that, that idea about the investment. Um, Cordell, why not, do you have any thoughts on the um, interview process? I'm going to unmute you. Well, I, I was smiling because uh, my best uh, critical friend in this one is my spouse. She's a vicious <laughs> mock interviewer, a vicious reviewer of my essays. And she's been through, I mean, the last 20 years with me. So law school, all that stuff. She's uh, stopped me from sending out some horrendous essays and uh, uh, some horrendous answers over the years. So I'm indebted uh, to her for uh, telling me the truth, whether I want to hear it or not. That's great. So, yeah, find that vicious critical partner, friend. as you said, the yes. critical friend who will be blunt with you. Yes, um, indeed. Yeah. And... Kara, I mean, you talked a little bit. Did you want to add anything to this? Uh, just uh, quickly, what I would say is that um, there are very there are lots of different types of interview processes, and having some insight into what type of interview process you're about to go into at that fellowship is really beneficial. So I've been involved in like these small group ones where you're doing activities. I've been ones where you had to make a little speech, where you had to, where you, there was a big panel, where you did a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews, or where like the, for the Watson, where it's just like a one-hour in-depth interview uh, with somebody. Um, so there's lots of different um, styles, and with those styles, I think there's maybe a little bit different approach um, to those interviews. But the one piece that might be really consistent across those is is um, maybe really do a little work around like mindfulness or presencing. And the reason I say this is because when you're in a room and you're the one talking, um, sometimes you can lose track of like the key point that you want to be making or what you want to leave people with. So you know, having a little bit of capability, just be like, I'm here, I'm present, I'm breathing, I'm engaged, and I see the other people in the room as people, as humans, you know, who are just like me and, and have some of that connection and be able to hear your own voice when it's, you know, it's like, oh, but I really wanted to bring this to was, you know, this specific point that I want to leave them with. You know, just having that awareness in the moment, I think is a good practice. So that's when you're doing mock interviews, when you're doing these things, just focusing on how present am I in this moment um, to hear that. And the second last little tip I'll throw in here is have some questions. Like, 
you know, don't be so in love with this fellowship that that you, you know, don't have some questions. I mean, like, if you're going away for a year, living on your own, or, you know, whatever it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be challenging. It could, it could really challenge you in some important ways. It's important. This is your life. It's important to have a couple of questions that, that you really want answers to. And almost every interview will give you an opportunity in some capacity to do that. And it's great if you have something available <laughs> that, you know, that's right for the moment. Yeah, I think that that is true. Like if you walk away and don't ask any questions and act as if this is a perfect opportunity, perfect in every way, it almost seems a little bit like uh, it's like a job interview, too. I mean, in jobs, if you don't have questions, then the committee's a little bit like, really, they don't have any questions at all about the position or yeah. what it entails or how it's going to challenge me or, <laughs> you know, so um, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, since you've seen a lot of candidates come through that selection process, talk, tell me about nervousness. You must have seen some nervous candidates. I mean, I've been nervous in interviews. Is that like, yeah. I mean, are you like done at the get-go if you're too nervous? I mean, have you ever seen anybody sort of overcome that in a kind of interesting way or uh, just, you know, still do a good job even if they were super nervous? Yeah, no, absolutely. And because I've been on different types of fellowship versus fellowship selection committee, it also matters if, if I'm serving in the one-on-one -on -one role, where if somebody comes in nervous on a one-on-one -on -one role for one hour, it's going to be okay. I mean, you've got a lot of time with somebody to kind of get your, you know, get your groove, even just take knowledge, you know, in the course of that conversation. Oh, you know, I'm so excited about this fellowship that I'm, you know, that I'm feeling this a little bit and you know here's what's really important for me that i wanted to share with you so sometimes like trying to hide it or you know it, people can see it anyway does that make sense like it's, yeah. it's not necessarily something that you need to feel <sighs> about you know anything like that because you know everybody's feeling that i think when they you know when they come in and they can show up in different ways it can show up with them being too blustery and too self-important it can show up in like being really timid and meek and you know in that moment so i just think um, you know, just having a little awareness, being able to name things sometimes, um, the longer your interview is, the more time you have to kind of, um, work that out. If it's more like, you know, a situation where you really do only have 10 or 15 minutes, I can't strongly enough suggest that Amy, um, Cuddy kind of presencing, I mean, just honestly, where you're just like physically like owning them, like before hands. you walk into yeah. that inner space, <laughs> you know, just do, do a little something and take up a lot of space, hands on hips, just kind of you know, just get a little bit and then just have something that you know you can re rely on without having to think too much when you're when you're connecting with people. I'm so glad to be here. Just have a little something that you could say that you just feel really comfortable about. It just immediately kind of gets you into the groove of things. And, and that's what I've seen work for people. Um, sometimes you have nice interviewers who want to help you get there. And then you have other times, I'm just going to be honest, where people are exploiting that, where they're, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, they'll come at you with a really hard question. Or like, and because they're trying to see how you're going to react under pressure or those kinds of things. Don't take that personally. Never, never take that personally. Even if it's like hitting the project that you worked on for like, you know, 50 hours, that's really hard. It feels like oh, it's yeah. your life stuff. Just kind of like take it in, reform it, and, you know, give it back out without it, you know, needing to, you know, really put you on the defensive. Just kind of think, think about it in those terms because it can come at you any number of ways and you just kind of need to stay strong in yourself and who you are. I love that. And, you know, every interview that you do, makes you just more prepared for the next one. Because when you get later in life, you know, you're gonna be more experienced doing interviews, so then you won't be as nervous, you'll feel more confident. But I like that about like, don't take it personally if someone's like really grilling you. To be honest, it's more a reflection of them than it is a reflection of you. And these are people, everyone's a person. Um, probably some people woke up that morning having a bad day or they maybe they're having a great day, but you just don't forget the interviewers are people too. So they, they want you to succeed. Most of them do. <laughs> so um, I like that advice. Um, I always keep in mind that the, when you're in, especially doing final round interviews, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to being cognizant of how I'm showing up because they're like, is this person a good representative of this organization or could they be? Um, I'm also, I like to walk in with the notion that they're looking for a reason to not say yes to me, okay? And so that, that gives you a boost, like, okay, I'm mostly in, um, and I, I'm i just not gonna give them a reason not to say yes. I wanna make it very challenging for them to exclude me from the cohort they're picking. And so yeah. that, that helps me, plus I've done a lot of interviews, so uh, I'm just not nervous anymore. Yeah, awesome, see? Just take some experience, 20 years Absolutely. of experience. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> yeah, Let's, and Vicky, oh, go ahead. we can, um, 
uh, I was going to add to it and then also encourage it. I probably most of the other panelists have, have sat on selection committees uh -huh. now. Yeah. yeah so I think that's for true. The, uh, the folks that have viewed, I'm just going to share a couple tips and then see if this sounds familiar. So when you're reviewing, you've got a scoring sheet in front of you. You've got 12 other candidates coming in. You're hoping to grab a cup of coffee. You're with a typical panel is two board members, uh -huh. third representative <laughs> participant, right? So these are somewhat structured like a grad school interview. Um, after you leave the room, these people are, including me, are shuffling papers, doing tab, uh, calculating the score, and trying to figure out in a rush discussion whether you fit you meet the mission, other things, how you presented yourself, both both good and bad. I mean, some of this is just fun because not all of us, and I think we'll talk about it later, nail interviews. But on panels, I've uh, I, I've heard comments from my fellow selection committees of he or she's not ready, meaning it, it was premature professionally or academically. I um, Somebody, and I, I think one of our panelists mentioned, don't oversell. Um, one of the panelists said, the response that the previous candidate just provided is a lie because I had that job at that organization. <laughs> so they literally knew the person's job description because this is a small world. The person probably was overselling their accomplishments. Who knew, right? So yeah, do try to, um, don't oversell. This is not uh, one of those opportunities. Do be proud of your accomplishments, uh, but stay focused. And then uh, lastly, and I'm uh, interested in other folks that have been on that side of the table, um, I knew somebody very well qualified. I had actually nominated the individual for the fellowship. Um, he must have had the worst morning in the history of his life because I've seen him speak in front of 10,000 person conferences. He came in front of four of us sweating to no end. Perhaps he had the flu, early flu. Um, that threw him a little bit off. And uh, oh. had the panel not gone back to read his application, gone back and also asked for anybody who recommended it. He just had a terrible interview, but he did the best he could. He sweated through it. We gave him towels uh, to, to deal with sweating <laughs> and everything. Uh, but he also did not say uh, to start out uh, saying, I'm terrible at interviews. I don't know why I'm here. It's a bad day. He did the best he could yeah. in those circumstances. So I don't know if other panelists have had uh, uh, those judging or selection panel conversations of, of any responses that you think a uh, potential applicant should hear behind the curtain. Oh. Wait, that's actually, uh, this is a little bit tangential, but you, you mentioned that this was somebody that you nominated for this fellowship and you're, you're kind of on the selection committee or something of that sort. Now, you are mentoring this person. I want to talk a little bit about professional networks and how important they are as you go, not just for fellowships, but as you go throughout your career, cultivating um, your professional network. Um, because I most people that I know that are multi-award winners have very strong cultivated professional networks. Um, for me, anytime I've applied for anything, I, t I spoke to former fellows, I spoke to, I uh, got advice from uh, people that I admire. Uh, I even, you know, I got recommendation letters from people that I was kept in touch with over years and years and years. So um, what can you guys give your insights on what it means to be, a, people tell me, oh, millennials hate to, to network, but I don't know if that's even true or what that means because I know they're digital natives. I'm like, well, all of us, but, um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your professional network, how you build it and how you leveraged it um, in your application, fellowship application process? Um, I'll, I'll Cordell, go, go ahead. Um, because I, I have a, a boast and it's absolutely true. Uh, since my very first fellowship, which is PPIA, I have never applied for a job cold, ever. Mm, see? If someone has tapped me from the network or someone recommended me from the network, um, I don't really understand what it's like to apply for a job cold with nobody saying, hey, you should do this, or I recommend this person for this. Please reach out to them. Um, so for me, network is everything. Um, it is the way I, I go about, I believe network is your net worth and relationships are everything. How have you like cultivated your network since, I mean, you, this is undergrad you're talking about. So what did you do from, you know, what did you do as an undergrad and what are you doing now as like an experienced professional? Well, uh, undergrad, I was in student government, so I, I was okay. always interacting with people. You're running for elections, um, so mm. you just know a lot of people, just very, very involved. The same carried over through graduate school. The fellowship actually helped me pay for graduate school, the very first one. Um, and then 
Um, every single one I applied for after that was, you know, for IBM or uh, the other places that I've been. Um, so it's, um, um, it, now would say my current role with Aspen, it is 100, our, our asset are people. There are, you know, a thousand people that come through Socrates every year. I evaluate maybe 800 of them if they're going to receive a scholarship. And so I'm constantly talking to people. I'm constantly feeding um, the network um, and engaging people all the time, mm -hmm. selling the work, um, selling the potential for uh, Aspen for their careers as accelerants. And so um, I think I'm in, constantly talking to people is, is the way it works out for me. Just, and Did then you, you find it out sounded, information as you constantly talk. Yeah, it, it yeah. sounded like you always liked talking to people from an early age. But, um, did any of you... Uh, uh, I'm just kidding. It's not my fault. No, no. I mean, you're. <laughs> that's always like a great thing. Some people, you know, are not people person or they don't yeah. think they're people person. Anybody have that experience? And like, how did you cultivate a network if you're not a people person? All, all of you may be people, people persons. I am an introvert, for sure. Okay. Um, so I was actually recently at a talk about uh, networking. There's a book called uh, Bagels versus Croissants um, for people like me, actually. <laughs> and I don't like the word networking. I like relationships. And it's very difficult to talk about networking without talking about relationships. So if I focus on the relationship piece as an introvert, that works for me. And so I love asking people questions, finding about what they're doing, finding about what they're interested in. That's how I find out about new opportunities. That's how I found out about the Fulbright. Um, I, when I had applied for the Gilman, it was mostly because I needed financial aid to study abroad. And before the results came out, there was a reception. And I decided that I was just going to go to a reception. And I sat down with people and I asked them questions and I found out about Fulbright. I found out about the born. All of these things that I wouldn't have known if I had not asked questions. And I wouldn't have known about Gilman if I hadn't gone to my professor and told them what my concerns were. So it's really just having conversations conversations with people and listening to what they have to say, because I do believe people love to share their knowledge. Uh, and if you give people an opportunity to share, especially if you're genuine, many times they will. And in terms of with following up, um, it was difficult for me at first because I'm like, I don't want to bother them. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ask them too many questions. I don't want to put more work on their table. But I know how I feel when someone asks my input or when someone asks for my expertise. I feel honored. So I just have to change the way I view things. And then it's easier for me to say, this is what I need. This person may be able to help me to get there. Um, and typically, people are pleased to be that uh, bridge. So that's great. So as an introvert, you don't even necessarily have to, to talk that much about yourself, which is what you dislike. It's more that you want to retrieve information from other people. So just ask lots of questions. And be willing to put yourself out there to do that. Um, I love that. I think that's a great way to just build networks and get, you know, everything, like I said, back in the day before Profello existed, everything I found was, um, you know, like word of mouth and internet, well, the internet as it was back then. So, um, you know, for me, like the net network was super important to find opportunities, but also understand, you know, how do you compete for these things? Um, now, it's... Um, it's 40 after the hour. I just want to get to one more question before I field some questions. And uh, the thing is, it's easy for us to talk about, you know, success. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about failure, because I think often uh, when we're faced with a rejection, it's not something that we share <laughs> on Facebook or social media or with our friends or even our family. Uh, sometimes I know a lot of applicants and I did this myself early on. Uh, I didn't even tell people that I was applying for things because I was so concerned about, well, if I don't get it, I don't want people to know that I didn't get it and uh, it's a failure and it's gonna look poorly on me. But uh, I've learned that that's like a big mistake. And actually uh, failure is a part of life. I've applied for things that I didn't win. Uh, you know, I, I eventually did my PhD, but uh, earlier in my career, I applied for a, a doctorate in public health at UNC that uh, I got an interview, but they told me frankly, you know, we don't think you're ready for this, despite the fact that I put tons of time into my application. And uh, I was upset, but then, you know, looking back, I thought, hmm, you know, they're probably right. I mean, I really wasn't prepared at that point for that particular program. And there's other things, scholarships and things I've applied for that I didn't even get an interview. Um, so it's it's kind of a misnomer to think that if you win a few fellowships, that suddenly you're a shoe in for any award, any fellowship. Uh, it's got to be a, be a good fit. 
Um, but can some of you share experiences with rejection? Because we talked a lot about things we've won and and then sort of like how we've how we've judged other people going through the process. But how about yourselves and in, in, in dealing with rejection? Who's dealt with rejection, and how did how, what did you learn from it? <laughs> I was gonna say I've definitely dealt with. Uh, Rejection. I mean, I've been a semi-finalist for Marshall. I was a finalist for the Loose and went through all of those um, interviews. And I, I think there is kind of this feeling, and I and I would even say my own experience has somewhat been that um, it's a little bit of a snowball. Like you know, when I got the fellow or the scholarship that I did in college, I did feel that it made me more competitive. I did, did feel like I was more vetted for candidates as, as, or interviewers and selection committees. They were seeing this vetting process that was happening for me and, and an experience where others had had good experiences with me as a fellow or as a student or as an employee, whatever it might be, that that kind of was a signal to the marketplace, if you will, that this is somebody worth investing in. So I would say there was a little bit of a snowball effect that I experienced. However, the loose is a really good example because I remember one of my um, – that, that's a series of small interviews or individual interviews. And I remember one of my interviews said, uh, they basically just said, why are you interviewing for this fellowship? Like, I feel like it's time for you to go to grad school or it's time for you to, you know, so that became like the, is this person a fellowship junkie? <laughs> just use that yeah. term briefly. But yeah. like, is this person serious about getting down to the business of contributing to life and to making a difference out there if that's what it is? Are you just, you know, going to keep taking these fellowships and, and what's the contribution going to be? And I thought it was outstanding feedback. Uh, and I think it was very, very valid um, in that. Now, what helps a person who's used to winning or maybe not used to winning, you know, these types of fellowships? Well, you know, in the work that I did around the book, which is around failure, um, there's a lot that has to do with mindset, right? And I loved, Ashley, what you were saying about reframing things to be in a place of relationship or acceptance. I think Carol Dweck's work, for any of you who are familiar with her, around growth mindset versus fixed mindset, is one of the most valuable skill sets as a human being, but certainly as somebody applying for fellowships, that you can adopt, which is looking at everything not as, you know, I'm a failure because I did not get this fellowship, but I failed at reaching my goal of getting this fellowship. What can it teach me? What can I take from this? What's the feedback that I can ask for? Um, and then how do I parlay that into my next experience and that type of mindset that allows you to and this is great from the entrepreneurship side too jack i'm thinking about your work i mean being able to to have that mindset that kind of is resilient that says this offers me something this tells me something um and it doesn't mean i shouldn't apply again right to something else or to find something that's a better fit but it's good to get some directional feedback on you know as to why you weren't a good fit because then it's like there are other things that will be, and there are things that you still bring and that you still offer. Or if it's a life goal that you have, like we saw this with Watson fellows just very quickly. We saw Watson fellows who designed a whole year for what their experience abroad was going to be, what their project was going to be. They didn't get the fellowship. Um, they went out and found a way to do that year in some other way. It might have been a three-month version of it. They might have made it happen for a year. They saw they were just scrappy and smart and good. And they went out and they had that life-changing experience that they worked so hard to shape. So remember what the end outcome is and see if there are other ways that you can create that outcome for yourself through a different pathway than just that fellowship saying yes or no to you. So that's my that's my little soapbox. I'll step off it for a second and see if somebody else has some experiences. Yeah, I have uh, I won four, but I probably applied for 30. I mean, I, I take a volume boxer approach to it. Think of a band and weight versus a heavyweight. The band and weights are gonna punch 600 times around and land 10 punches and the heavyweights punch 70 times and, and land four punches, but those four are very significant. And so, um, I, the, probably the worst interview I've ever had was Coro, uh, that exercise that Carb was talking about. My person sitting there silently, uh, looking at you and like, what the hell's wrong with you? It was the <laughs> dumbest thing ever. And I, I remember being so bitter about that experience. And then you, you win and you forget about it. And so I, I say, especially early in your career, be a volume boxer. Swing a lot. I mean, swing with precision, but swing a lot because you got to know that you're not going to win every time. I like that. Any Anybody else want to share? I think I can share a little bit. Um, the first thing I would say is you're not entitled to any award. Um, and I remember that when I applied, they don't have to give me anything and, uh, they don't actually have to give me a reason why they didn't give me anything, but it's great when I do get feedback and starting with that mentality, I think sets me up for, if this doesn't work out, 
I'm still okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I applied for the Freeman Asia the same time I applied for Gilman. And I got my rejection from Freeman Asia first because I had something, another opportunity out there, I did feel like, okay, this one didn't work out, but there might be another opportunity, exactly what you were saying, Cardell. Um, but I applied for the Born, and similar to Fulbright, for the Born, you need to have um, someone in your institution to push your application forward. And um, we had been in communication a lot, and she asked for a specific meeting with me, and she says, I don't think you're a good candidate. And that was the first time I had a negative experience with her. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't think I'm a good candidate for this? <laughs> and looking back, I was not a good fit. I didn't like anything about government. I hated political science. I only liked econ a little bit. So why would I want a fellowship where I'd be, you know, that would prepare me to work in government? Um, so I, I see that now. Again, it took a little bit of humility to be like, is this really a good fit for me? So it's not always personal, and sometimes it's a, a great blessing that doesn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me just uh, reiterate, or I, I, I too have not received some fellowships. I've never received feedback on why I didn't receive them. Maybe I wasn't aggressive enough and sort of backtracking through the organization. Um, but to that degree, you know, be resilient, as was mentioned earlier on. Don't take it as an excuse maybe not to, in between cycles or applications, refine your writing, your storytelling, or what have you. And um, I, I did want to mention, uh, that was an excellent story about the one uh, applicant that didn't get the opportunity to get the fellowship, but went on the journey anyway. Um, I've been on a selection panel where this, one of the standard questions were, um, if you don't get this fellowship, what will you do? Yeah. which at times is a loaded question to ask you, are you truly passionate or will you only do this on our dime? Only mm -hmm. if you get all the creature comforts of this fellowship, do you care about this cause? So be ready. Think about that one. It gets into the, the why your motivations and mm -hmm. potentially it's one of the advanced questions a panel might throw at you. Yeah, I like that. And I, and I wanted to um, touch a little bit on, on something you said, Ashley, about, you know, that we're not entitled to these awards. And I do think, um, you know, people do ask me a lot about, you know, when you're doing multiple awards, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I mean, clearly I, we're all here. We've won multiple awards, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a great fit for every award. And also um, sometimes fellowship committees truly don't want to give you your fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth award because they're looking to award people that haven't had that opportunity yet. So again, that's nothing personal against you or to say that your application wasn't strong. It just might be that their mission is to give funding to new people entering a field or that sort of thing. So um, it, it's not it's not really a good plan to say I'm going to go through my career and, and just do fellowships and, and that's how I'm going to do it. Um, but it is uh, you can do multiple fellowships over the course of your career if um, if they if they really truly meet a, a certain goal that you have. For me in my field in, in public policy, it was great because I was kind of uh, doing specific projects in a very niche topic, children in disasters and emergency management. So for me, it was awesome. So yeah, it can it can work out. But you know, I, I like the idea like you don't want to walk into it feeling entitled like, okay, I'm, I'm, I've got this great resume, I'm a shoe in this is awesome, because it will <laughs> shoot you in the foot. If you're not uh, a little more as as Kara would say, a little self aware, have some presence. <laughs> I, I recently had some come up and I want to say two years ago, it was a, a fairly new fellowship for seasoned professionals. I recommended successfully two people forward. Those same two people recommended me. I got rejected. Oh, see. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes my head, I'm done with fellowships. <laughs> hey, I think I also said too, I said, I don't think anyone's going to give me any more fellowships. So that's why I'm doing pro fellow to help other people. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I do you. feel, I yeah, <laughs> I, I do feel because I, I think that I do want more and, and more people uh, who aren't in the know to find these things and win them. So I think, you know, sharing your expertise today is great. Um, oh, and so we have about 10 minutes left. I wanted to field some questions that were posted. Uh, one, um, I don't know if any of you can um, speak to this. I could potentially, but about um, fellowships to change careers. Did any of you make a career change potentially through a fellowship? I think, Jack, you mentioned about at mid-career you wanted to maybe get new expertise or something or I don't know if there's uh did you did you make a career change or career shift of any sort 
I, I did not. No, it was it was a, a mid career. It happened to be the um, same time uh, Cordell got his uh, Eisenhower Fellowship. My learning and, and purpose were sort of um, extending my line of sight in economic development globally and specifically with China, which is something I had not focused on, but still within the public service realm and that just sort of trying to become a better public servant as opposed to intentionally or honestly even being exposed to a radically different sector. I'm not sure if any of the, of the other panelists have done an exploratory, so to speak, mm -hmm. fellowship to try or tread new waters. Yeah, my experience has been not so much that I sought out. Usually graduate school for me has been the, the types of times when I've made career shifts and I've gone intentionally into those programs potentially to try and, and make some of those shifts. Um, but with fellowships, it's kind of been like happy mistakes, like life-changing life mistakes. Like So as an undergrad, when I was graduating, I was so clear. I'd been an English creative writing major and a psychology um, major and I was like I'm gonna do my PhD and I you know I was and I was gonna go straight like immediately thought that was and I was like well let me just try my hand at this this Watson thing because it sounds so interesting so compelling when I was fortunate enough to win a Watson and have that experience it just blew my mind and it completely changed how I saw the world and what I wanted to do and so I came back from that fellowship very much with a career switch so pursuing something like an MBA and a master's in public policy those types of things became um, something that had not at all been on my radar and had been such powerful, you know, game changers for me in terms of like how I show up in organizational leadership or how I, or how I serve around social impact with in a totally different way than I ever would have expected coming straight out. And that was the fellowship, um, both Coro and Watson, that just blew my mind open to what the other possibilities were and facilitated experiences and career shifts for me almost by accident. Uh, I would say that I have a very same experience when I did Eisenhower I was running a startup. It wasn't my intent to not continue the startup when I got back, but after this amazing experience in China um, and then a pretty consequential election in the U.S., I just felt the need to get back into the game, the, the civil society game. And um, I mean, things just happened for me post-fellowship very, very quickly. Within a month, I was moving back to D.C. to work for the Aspen Institute. I should add, so we talked earlier about the network to get the fellowship. Um, the network you come out of a fellowship with is amazing. Mm -hmm. so, as, I, as I mentioned, I didn't sort of pursue the, the fellowship to change, do career change, but I, I traveled with a cohort from all different type of industries, inevitably in the short term, medium term, and now I expect lifelong, I have access to these leaders in multiple industries. Should I consider to change, get feedback? I've got this rich network. I don't think I would have developed at Starbucks over coffee incrementally. Mm. And, and what's more, what I found, uh, especially as I've, you know, post 30, uh, the two fellowships I've done in my 30s and early 40s, um, the uh, calling process of the selection for these people, just really, really high quality people. And so the, the folks I met at Eisenhower, the folks I met at Bosch are people that I'm closer to because we have had the shared experience and they're just really high quality people. They're, they're very significant in my personal life, in my professional life and in my greater network. I feel perfectly confident sending people to them. I know exactly who that person is and what they're about. And because I sent them, I know they'll be treated well. Mm. Someone, uh, someone else was asking about fellowships uh, for older people, late career. Um, you know, the Eisenhower one that you mentioned, um, maybe not everybody listening knows exactly what these fellowships are. The Eisenhower one is for more experienced professionals. Yeah. Um, what's the age range on that? Like, I mean, do you see- 32 people? to 45. That's 32 to 45. And then- right. um, have any Bosch is up to 40, 30 to 40, 34. Okay. So it does, they are still kind of, uh, I would say that's still young. I, <laughs> I, I agree, say, honey. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> just believe me, I'm in there. Um, but have any of you found some, uh, I know that there's some fellowships out there for, uh, you know, late career. Not a lot. I mean, a lot of the fellowships do, they are kind of skewed toward younger professionals. I think again, because they're investing in you because they want to right. see what you're going to do throughout your career. Yeah. Um, but have you guys have any of you have an eye on a fellowship you're going to do a little bit later yet? Is there was anything you learned about? Um, a, a premature one for me, I, uh, 
and no teasing or laughing from the, my fellow panelists, but I had a chance to sit down with uh, um, Joanne Jenkins from AARP. AARP <laughs> is getting younger and more innovative, and I'm really proud to say that they're doing a lot, right? As Americans, we're living longer and people are having multiple careers, uh, including in, in the world of startups and that stuff. Um, they're doing they're doing great things out there. Uh, I think corporations are hosting individual fellows now at a later stage in the career. They want the experience and wisdom, maybe from a different sector, a different set of eyes for their unique mission. So I, th I think they are out there, um, and I don't want any other panelists competing with me for the ARP. <laughs> I'm right. sure you're saying out. you don't want us to find out about them before you do. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. I, actually, I think they're. Uh, yeah. would love to consider when my daughter is in college in you know several years uh, Peace Corps um, yeah. as an older person um, I would seriously think that I could do it even though I've lived a life of creature comforts I think I could do it and I at least want to at least try uh, when I'm in my 50s and not paying college tuition yeah, there is um, both Peace Corps and even the AmeriCorps program uh, which is almost like a Peace Corps for the US they do recruit people uh, all the way up to like age, you know, up retirement. So um, that those are two programs you can do. Um, so yeah, the number of fellowships at that older age do sort of dwindle. However, um, you know, they're still out there. And you know, it really is up to us to kind of encourage organizations exactly. to create fellowships for yeah. um, older people because uh, they have so much to contribute. So and, and like several at the, the Aspen Institute, uh, the, you have the Crown Fellowship, you have the finance leaders, yeah. you, I mean, the, I can, health leaders, you have a, a multitude that are not age capped at all. It's about impact, it's not about your age. That's so, true, that's I, true. Ethically too. That was the other thing I was going to say is now for where I am in my career, some of the geographically located one, like leadership foundations mm -hmm. that are in cities, like I've done several programs that have put me in Colorado and specifically in Denver where I am, and it's had huge impact from a network standpoint for where I live and am in place. So just just think, you know, both nationally and internationally, but also think locally for the opportunities that are out there because they're very meaningful on, an, on a relationship standpoint. That's very true. Well, it's at the hour, past the hour. I want to thank all of you so much for your contributions today. I think, um, you know, I meant to write down the little snippets that I got. I'm going to do it for an article uh, because you guys gave some like really, really good specific um, tips for people as they're going out applying and also just to help people not be intimidated by the process. Um, it's easy for us to say because we've won them, but for people who are new to this process, I think um, there's ideas about leveraging your network, doing your research, uh, reaching out, asking lots of questions to get down to the bottom of what it is, is super helpful. So I just want to thank all of you for your time and attention and, um, you know, we hope you'll you'll stay engaged and stay in touch with us at Profello. Great. All right, Vicky, uh, can we take a selfie? Sure, let's do it. <laughs> Are you taking it, Jack? There you go. I got it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. And this sub uh, presentation will be available at the same YouTube link, so you can rewatch it and enjoy it and share it with your friends. Great. Thank you so Great. much. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. All right. Happy holidays. Happy bye -bye. holidays.